Good morning. Welcome to another session of hashtag LD EduChat Leadership Development in Education Online. We're so, so pleased that you could join us. We know it's half term, but our sessions are running all the way through this week uh, just for you. Today, we've got uh, Lisa Dolan on Twitter. So at Chilton TSA, make sure you use the hashtag LD EduChat. It makes it so easy for us to find your comments. And when you've shared your thoughts, online we can actually then engage with you so without further ado today's session we have david didal and he'll be talking about reading aloud welcome uh, to my presentation on why we need to read aloud uh, my name is david didal and uh, here here it is so to start with as as i'm sure you all know readings are very complex uh, tightly set of interwoven knowledge and skill and skilled reading takes in all sorts of different things and there's a lot that can potentially go wrong and one of the uh, interesting things to know about the struggles that students sometimes have when they're learning to read is that there is no correlation at all between the, the word recognition strands of learning to read and how able students are. So these are the, this is from Keith Stanovich, these are the sorts of things that we'd need to test, the hypotheses we'd need to test in order to find, establish a link between decoding and intelligence. And his take is that there is no such evidence. In fact, the evidence that we've tended to find has been negative. It's It's been against that. So we can't really support the idea that, that children who struggle to read are not necessarily lacking in ability. So if that's not the case, what, what sort of things do get in the way? Well, one of the uh, things which I think is interesting and perhaps uh, uh, not considered enough is a condition called glue ear. If you've, if you've uh, never experienced glue ear, it's a little bit like having your fingers over your ears and, and trying to listen to people, it's a bit muffled and indistinct. And um, according to the NHS, eight out of every 10 children at, at some time between the ages of four and 10 are likely to have undiagnosed glue ear. And if you're unlucky enough to have glue ear at the time when you're first being taught to read, then there's a possibility, a likelihood perhaps, that you're going to struggle to hear what your teacher's teaching you. Similarly, there are other students who have undiagnosed visual problems. According to Optometry Today, there's an estimation that maybe one in five, 20% of children have undiagnosed visual problems, which could either be self-correcting as they, as they get older or need correcting with glasses. Uh, on top of all that, we've got problems caused by the English writing system, our orthography. And if you look at this map, you can see here errors in word reading at the end of the first year of instruction. And uh, you can, if you look at those, you scan your eye over those statistics, the percentage of word errors in some country, like Finland, everyone loves Finland, that's really low, only 2% of errors in Finland. But, uh, but what's going wrong in Britain? And I've, you know, I've carefully labelled that as Britain rather than as, as England, because um, the, the problem is with, it's not, it's not that we're necessarily, it's not that we're rubbish at teaching, it's the problem of what we're teaching, the English language, it's a deeper more opaque orthography than any of the other European languages. If you look, you know, you can probably guess quite quickly that other languages like, like Danish, French, Portuguese are also more opaque orthographies, um, but they're not, they're not as opaque as English. And this, this graph here sort of demonstrates the challenge and the difference between learning to read English, French and Spanish. And you can see here the green lines representing the progress that a Spanish child's making between the age of uh, seven and nine. And they're not really improving all that much. A French child is making quite dramatic progress. And by the time they're nine, they're, but they, they still necessarily haven't caught up with a Spanish seven-year-old. And um, we've got the, an English child here who's making very remarkable progress between the ages of seven and nine, but at the age of nine is still roughly at the, the, the level of a French seven-year-old because uh, we've got a lot more to learn. That, you know, that's a particular difficulty that there's a lot can go wrong. It's um, maybe more important in, in English to get that right than perhaps in other languages. And getting it right, one of the markers of getting it right is being able to read fluently, being able to decode accurately, but also at a, at a, at a pace to support comprehension. And what I wanted to do here is just give you uh, an, an idea of what it might be like to be a student who can't decode fluently. So I'm going to give you um, a piece of text to read. As you read it, I'm going to try and divert your attention talking over it. So good luck. 
they. As you can see, not only do you have to wait for the next word to appear, you also have to remember what words went before. And this is quite a challenge on your working memory. There's a, there's a lot that you have to juggle in order to work out the sense that's being communicated. And you might well find that uh, it's a frustrating, perhaps unpleasant experience. And I'm prepared to, to bet that some of you watching may already have given up. Um, and if you have given up, I'm sorry about that bit, that was top. If you have given up, then uh, welcome to the world of the struggling reader that this is the lived experience of lots of children, that they're routinely asked to read text in school which, for which they, they don't have the ability to read it fluently. And so, uh, so they, you know, they feel they can't read, they can't do it, and they get frustrated and, uh, and, and give up, as perhaps you have. Some of you, though, uh, no doubt, are persevering and are seeing this through persisting in order, perhaps, to, to prove me wrong and to show that you can comprehend it, even at, with these barriers. And... And that may be the case, and, and it's a, you know, the thing to remember here, this is a relatively short piece of writing, it's a single sentence. Uh, imagine doing this with a whole page of text. Now, you're, you're receiving currently a, a, a contextual clue. Uh, some of you watching may now know what uh, this sentence is from, who wrote it, when it was written. Uh, some of you may not and may feel even more alienated as a result. But, uh, but where, you know, even if you are persisting, you almost certainly wouldn't do this for pleasure because it's not pleasurable. It's effortful. It takes a lot of concentration and therefore is something that, you know, the, the, the human beings seek to avoid that kind of effortful activity in order to focus on things that we find easier to do. Uh, right. Well, we're, if you gave up early on, uh, this has no doubt been a, been a tedious experience and I can only apologise for that, but it's almost over and uh, we've got the, the penultimate word coming up and there's the last word and what word is that there's two possible words that could be um, whether or not you guessed correctly wound or wound will depend on whether or not you were paying attention and following so let's see how you did so uh, i'm going to give you some very very straightforward comprehension questions and the first question i've got is is a bit of a give me so you know that in order to build your confidence um And then question two, three, what point did they first see Pemberley House? So there's a different answer to two. If you'd said Pemberley House for two, possibly you were wrong. Um, where was the house in relation to the characters? And how did the author describe the road? Now you may, you may have been able to answer all or some of those questions, but it was probably more challenging than you're, than you're used to. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an insight here into the fact that you can give children a passage to read and then very, very basic recall questions about the text itself and, and then watch them struggle. And the reason they're struggling is probably a lot to do with their, their disfluency, their inability to read with enough accuracy and, and a fast enough pace in order to support their comprehension. And if I take away the barrier and now you've got the text next to the questions and you can very easily cross reference between the two and you can find, you know, finding the answers is effortless. There's no challenge there at all. So let's move forward to this. So as every teacher knows, there's lots of students who report, especially in secondary school, they report if you ask them, they say they hate reading. But when you, they don't tend to hate stories, they, they enjoy. You know, one of the things that I certainly found as an English teacher is that you could take Friday afternoon, a truculent class of teenagers and read to them. And uh, and they'd be like lambs. They'd 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 uh, they just they just quieten down and, and and listen pretty much regardless of what they were, they were being read. But obviously, content had a big role to play. Now, it's if you ask children to read independently, if you give them reading material and say read that, unless they've been they've mastered decoding, they're going to struggle with that. It's going to be effortful and difficult. It's going to be akin to your experience reading that sentence from Pride and Prejudice. So practicing fluency is something that is, that's difficult to do in the context of reading for comprehension. It's something that has to be done often, especially when you're, you're older. If you haven't mastered this in key stage one, then it becomes increasingly difficult to get the sort of fluency practice that you need in order to do it. But if you haven't mastered it by the time you get to secondary school, you're, you're in trouble and you, you'll need intervening with and withdrawing from regular lessons in order to master this. If you don't master it, then you're on a very predictable trajectory and you're likely to end up 
leaving school without really being able to read, um, without being functionally literate and without doing particularly well in your assessments, regardless of your ability. One of the things I, I want to sort of suggest and talk about is that is, is about being, is, is, as the title of the presentation made clear, it's about reading aloud. And some people sort of feel that there's something cheating. You're not doing the proper work if you're, if you're just listening, if you're not actually doing the reading yourself. You know, I can understand where that's coming from, uh, but I don't think it's true at all because the purpose of reading is to consume the information, not to go through the process of decoding. That's just simply a means to an end. You know, there, there's all sorts of research which is suggesting the idea that, you know, the kind of comprehension of written text is pretty similar to the, 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 compre the comprehension that we have to spoken language. Obviously, there are differences. Different kinds of vocabulary crop up in written text, different, different sophistication of syntax often. But basically, if somebody says something to you aloud that you can't understand, then that's a global comprehension problem that isn't necessarily linked to your reading ability. If you're, if you, if you're read to, the barriers become your vocabulary knowledge, your background knowledge, not your reading ability. For particularly for difficult to understand texts, actually reading them aloud, the prosody, the sound of the, the rhythm of the, the music of the text, the, the pronunciation of the words can really help people understand what they're meant to be reading. And, and one of the, the key things, the key points I want to make is this one, that there are, there are problems with asking students to follow along as you read to them. So the typical sort of classroom practice of everyone has a copy of the text and as a teacher, I'm, I'm asking, you know, maybe I'm reading myself or I'm asking students to read and I'm monitoring whether they're, they're all reading. And, if, and I might have a system where you read a sentence and then the next person is meant to start immediately. And if there's any pause or hesitation, I'd go, oh, you're not, you're not paying attention, you're not reading along. And the problem with that is that it's, it's onerous for children to split their attention between what they're listening to and what they're attending to on the page. And by trying to do both at once, then that's an unbearable problem. This is uh, something that might be familiar to you. It's a, it's a, a model of how um, attention and memory might work. The the idea here is that you know our working memory is is it mediates how much information we can process at any one time. And uh, those of you that uh, know about things like dual coding will know what we can bypass some of the limits of working memory by by making use of the phonological loop, our ability to pay attention to sort of verbal information and the, the sketch pad, our ability to think about pictures at the same time and, and therefore uh, concentrate on more. But the issue with following text along is that written text and, and, and verbalised text, spoken language, are both processed in this same area that's, uh, that's referred to by psychologists as the phonological loop. And what tends to happen here is that we store information for a few seconds. This, this store lasts a few seconds and then needs repeating in order to... La uh, so if new information sort of pushes into the phonological loop, it pushes out what was in there earlier. So the visual presentation of words and the auditory presentation is both dealt with in the same place. And they're trying to get children to follow along and attend to a teacher reading or a peer reading is almost impossible for them to do. So able readers, skilled readers, what they tend to do is just block out the teacher, read ahead, and then we tell them off, and oh, you've read ahead, you've spoiled it. Uh, and then, then, then students who struggle more with reading, they're more likely, if they want to comprehend, to put the book down and pay attention to the, the, the reading that's being done aloud preventing them from doing that. And there, there are all sorts of reasons why you might, you know, to, to try and have control over potentially difficult uh, difficult behaviour. And, and, and I think there are times when you do want students to read along. So if you want them to focus on a particular passage and say, right, everybody, eyes on this, look at this, what does what this suggest? What do you think is going on here? Then fine. But if your goal is comprehension, then your best bet is to get children either to read independently or listen, but trying to do both at the same time is uh, is probably a mistake in most cases. Uh, what, so the, the idea, you know, the, in, in support of that, um, just a few ideas in support of that, the idea of silent reading is surprisingly recent. It's not actually been around for as long as we might think. And, and the, the fourth century uh, Christian saints and Ambrose is apparently unusual 
because he read silently and it was so unusual that people commented on us a little quote here from Augustine talking about um, how unusual Ambrose's reading was and so that wasn't typical even even when Augustine was writing later so the idea that we read silently that silent reading is something we all do to some extent is a little bit of an illusion we all tend as we're reading to subvocalize to turn words into sounds you know beneath the level that can be heard We've, we've said earlier that uh, prosody can really aid meaning, and there's, there's, if you're those of you that are interested and want to follow some references there, there they are. I've got a little example here, a, pa a short sentence from the novel Lolita by uh, Vladimir Nab Nabokov, and, and I defy anyone to, to try and read that silently without subvocalizing the sounds, without turning that into sound, because it's, if, you're, if you're focusing on what he's saying, it's, it's almost impossible not to hear it in your mind's ear, but have a go. The first word there that I'm I'm partially covering is Lolita. I'll just give you a moment to try and read that to yourself uh, if you if you can be bothered. It's great, isn't it? It's uh, there's there's something beautiful about the, the structure and the sounds of that sentence. So think big picture. Thinking big picture here. So the, the, we're, we're working in schools, teachers, school leaders. What should be our goal? You can only have one top priority, what should it be? And it, when presented as such a stark binary there, most people feel that developing fluent readers is, is, is a really worthy, important goal, and that often people say that should be our priority, but the accountability system means you know, that what we're held to account for isn't whether or not students are fluent, it's whether they pass exams. And, and I know from you know, my experience as, a, as an English teacher is that over the years, I've definitely taught children who I've got through an exam that couldn't really read well enough to be functionally literate. Uh, but nevertheless, with enough coaching and preparation and, and, and a fair trailing wind, they managed to, to get through an exam. One of the things I'd like to suggest to you is that reading fluency benefits everybody within the system, the students themselves, obviously, but also us as their teachers uh, and the, the whole community. Everybody benefits from that. But for individual teachers, committing their lesson time to reading fluency isn't likely to benefit them. It's likely to be a bit of a problem, uh, you know, because what they're held to account for is students doing well in their subjects. So if you're sort of balancing between, should I do some work on reading fluency or should I teach some more history or more mathematics or more science? Well, of course, the pressures that exist in the system means that you're going to prioritise exam success. And, you know, that's 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 uh, that's not a problem. Uh, well, it might be a problem, but it's not. It's not a surprise. So, what I want you to imagine, a little thought experiment here, is imagine you're you're teaching a class of Year Nine students, and imagine you're their history teacher. Maybe some of you are history teachers, but for the rest of you, imagine you're teaching history, and you're teaching them about the Battle of the Somme and the First World War. And and I'm artificially going to limit your choices to three options here. You could either give them some sort of article or passage to read about the causes of um, the Battle of the Somme and what went on, or you could think to yourself, well, I can actually, I've actually found a really accessible clip on YouTube which contains much of the same information. I could show them that instead. Or your third option is to play some sort of fact-finding game where you've concealed the information around the classroom and children have to sort of collect it and work in groups and and, uh, and, 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 and do, do that sort of thing. So obviously it's an artificial choice, but if you're limited to one of those choices, you know, the, the, we know as teachers that if you give children a, a, a page of written text and you say, read this aloud, what they, you know, they, they make a particular noise. They respond by going, oh, well, do I have to do a whole thing? So we know that that's, that's going to, that's a, that's a surefire way to undermine ourselves in our lessons. If instead we can find a YouTube clip, why, why wouldn't we? It makes complete sense in the teaching of your subject. You know, if, you, if instead you've gone for the fact-finding game, maybe the benefit there is, you know, they all think you're a legend or something like that. But, but giving them the written, so the, 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 the writing to read is likely to be the least popular uh, of the choices. So as teachers, I think there are systematic pressures against you, preventing you from giving children written material to read because you're not sure if it's going to be the best way 
to focus them on exam success, even though it might be it might be a great way to get reading fluency. So um, we'll come back to to a solution to that in a moment. But just here some 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 I'm going to sell some of the benefits of reading, which you may or may not need convincing of. So uh, a, a survey here done by the National Literacy Trust correlated children's exam results, their their test results, test scores with self, their self-reported ideas on how much they liked reading. And you can see here that children who said they really liked reading, they liked it very much, over a third of them exceeded expectations in terms of test scores. Those children that said that they didn't like it at all, very few of them did uh, as well as you might have expected, or fewer of them did as well as you might have expected. A US study, which can seem at first glance slightly counterintuitive, is this idea that um, if you... There seems to be something slightly magical about the idea of 20 minutes a day. If you ask children to read for 20 minutes a day, on average, at the end of a year, they'll maybe have read around 1,800,000 words. Whereas, if you ask them to read for five minutes a day, they're only likely to encounter about 282,000 words. Now, you'd think, you know, four times five, that doesn't quite stack up. And the, part of the reason for that is, if you've got five minutes, uh, you know, you spend the first couple of minutes faffing about, settling down, finding your place. And there's something about the sustained nature of 20 minutes of reading, which means you're likely to get far more benefit from it. Uh, back to the National, Re um, National Literacy Trust, same cohort of children, and uh, again, looking at those same test scores, they also asked them how often they read. And, and there's, again, there's a clear correlation between the regularity of your reading, the frequency of your reading, and how well you're likely to perform in school. Let's go back to the problem of reading fluency. We've got children who aren't able to read well enough to enjoy reading or certainly be expected to do it independently every day. We know the more you read, the more you know, the more you know, the more you can think, the more you can think, the, the more interesting the, the, the way you can use your mind becomes. How can we get children who can't decode fluently to read independently? Well, you know, that's a long and that's another presentation. But for ordinary teachers in teaching their subjects in their classroom, the answer's not much. It's a systemic problem. It needs to be addressed, at, especially in secondary schools, outside of classrooms. But there's an interesting idea that, that's come out of a study that was done uh, last year by Joe Westbrook and colleagues. And it's a very small scale study and it's, you know, the, there are problems with its methodology and I don't think we should, we should take some of its findings with a bit of a pinch of salt. But basically what they did in this study is they took 20 English teachers and, and they got them to replace their year eight curriculum with the reading of two novels back to back. The children in the study were given a standardised reading test before the trial started and then afterwards. And on average, they found that the children in the study made around eight months progress over the 12 weeks of the study. And that's pretty good. And we can, you know, that, 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 if, that's, if that's all that the study found, then we could, be, they, we could be pretty encouraged and happy about that. But they also found that children that they identified as being from more disadvantaged backgrounds did even better. On, on average, children from more disadvantaged backgrounds doubled that rate of progress, making an average of 16 months uh, progress, which is, you know, perhaps too good to be true. But there's something kind of interesting there, because because by just reading, by going through text and, and, and having them read in classroom, without all of the other stuff that, that typically goes on when, when that sort of thing's happening, children were encountering far more vocabulary, they were they were finding out more about the world, and, and maybe it's those things more than more than any, anything else, which is likely to have the, the boost and the advantages we want. So what I'm suggesting, and it's especially in a time of lockdown, you know, maybe it's something that we can really give some thought to, is the, the how much reading aloud we can do with children. If we do more of it, you know, maybe that's a way also to deal with that tragedy of the commons, the fact that we all benefit from children reading more, but not in our lesson. If we give them text to read, oh, I don't want to read that. But by reading aloud to them, we can overcome some of the barriers and get many of the benefits. So I hope that um, that, that, you know, that whistle stop tour through that made sense. I'm going to ask some questions here uh, live. This is a pre-recording, but these are my key messages. So just a reminder, there's no correlation between decoding and intelligence. If children can't decode, it's not because they're thick. Reading fluency is a, it's a huge issue. It's a real endemic issue. To, to comprehend verbally or through reading depends on how how much you know about the world. People love stories, no matter if they say they hate reading. Being read to, I suggest, is, a, is an important mechanism in the, the battle to help increase children's intellectual 
capability. I hope you found some of that interesting and useful and uh, I look forward to discussing your thoughts. Now, thanks very much. Welcome everyone. Obviously we've got uh, lots of people in attendance today. I wanted to kind of just quickly reach out and make a few shout outs for people that are joining us. So we've got people right across the UK spanning sort of northern parts of Scotland right the way down to as far as Cornwall. We're also joined by international guests as well. We've got people from uh, Singapore, so Katie from Singapore and Aruna from India as well. So I think it kind of really sort of impresses on us just how important the orthography of the English language is, and it's not just a UK-based consideration. And I think that's the third time I've watched that presentation now, David, and I think it's still the third time again that I've found myself going through that Lolita passage and mouthing out all of the words as well, rather than reading it sub-vocally in my head. So it's a, it really is kind of a really sort of powerful sort of uh, bit of text there. So I think obviously um, there's a lot of activity on the Chilton TSA Twitter. David, without much further hold up, let's jump straight into the questions. And I think there's a lot of popularity in the question around exam success and how we reconcile the difficulty in silent reading when they need to do so in an exam. Yeah, absolutely. And um, my, I suppose the, the, the position that I've been taking here about um, reading aloud is that I think this is effective classroom practice. It's a great way to increase um, the amount of background knowledge that children gain in the, in the vocabulary that they gain um, in school. But it doesn't give them the kind of orthographic experience they need to do well in exams. So on top of this, it's absolutely essential that children master basic decoding. And if they haven't got that in, in Cree Stage 1, um, then they're into a, a situation where there's sort of decreasing likelihood that the school system has time to give them what they need. And you know, if you get as far as secondary school and, you, and you're not a fluent decoder, then, then you're on a reasonably predictable trajectory. Um, so the answer, though, is, is that as an individual classroom teacher, there's really not much you can do about this. Even if you're an English teacher in a secondary school, you almost certainly don't have the expertise to solve those decoding issues. So it, the, the whole school, the whole school policy has to be in place to, to intervene with those students in a meaningful way, to, to, to give them what they, you know, I, I had an experience as, um, oh, probably over 10 years ago now, where um, I was teaching um, a class, a year nine class, it was year nine bottom set, uh, and they knew it, you know, it was one of those little classes about 10 kids in uh, all boys all you know all you know a bit sort of chopsy and and uh when i first met them our, our first lesson we all went around we introduced ourselves and there was one lad who i remember so vividly i'll call him ben and uh, his introduction to me was to say my name's ben i can't read and i'm thick and and you know uh that's that's tough to hear and, and uh, but it wasn't true. It was really quickly became obvious to me teaching him that he was a sparky chap. He was really good at sort of seeing connections between the different things that we were, we were learning about and, um, and, and that whatever else his problem was, it wasn't an ability problem. And, and we, this was, you know, I say some years ago, it was back in the days of, you know, the, the new Labour government where there was just oceans of cash swilling around in the system. And we, were, we tapped into some funding um, for him to, for various students to have um, some, some off-site one-to-one -one phonics instruction. And, and this lad uh, basically had six weeks intensive phonics instruction off-site. And he came back to school after six weeks. He was, he was a different boy. He could, he could, he could now read. And uh, we found out for a process of detective work that when he was in primary school, he, he almost certainly had glue ear. Um, so when his teacher was trying to teach him how to read, he just couldn't really hear as well as as his peers and, and didn't pick it up. And and obviously that's a bit of a Rolls Royce solution. I don't think many schools these days have the have the, the funds to be able to do that kind of thing. But you need to have some sort of some sort of capacity for doing that sort of stuff. But as an individual teacher, you know, you're a history teacher, science teacher. There's no way you can solve children's fluency issues. But what you can do is read aloud to them more in the classroom. I think for, for me, being a non-English teacher, it was one of the things I sort of picked up on is obviously trying to introduce that a bit more into the subject to obviously support the students in that sort of yeah. wider context. I think that's a really sort of poignant bit for me as well. I think, again, with that is how we then make that jump then from us reading to them and teaching them to them becoming independent readers. How, how would you suggest that we might 
tackle that? You know, it's, it, that's essentially the same thing. If they haven't learned to fluently decode, you're not, they're not going to make that jump. They have to learn that. The jump doesn't, there is no jump. So it's, it's back to basics. It's, and it's, it's a relatively small domain to master the phoneme, grapheme correspondences, the, the yeah. link between the sounds and the letters. Uh, one of the things that I've, you know, I don't have empirical evidence for this, but one of the things I've done with uh, some of the schools that I've worked with is, you know, I take in a, a set of uh, flashcards with uh, words with, with various different graphemes on there. And you sit down with a child who, who is not a fluent decoder and you go through the, the flashcards. Uh, the, the idea is to go through as rapidly as possible so that they're, 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 they're decoding the word without hesitation and you show them the word they, they give the and if they don't if they don't decode it immediately it goes into a not not mastered pile if they do you'd, you'd, you'd put into the mastered pile and you'd basically I, I found that just by repeating this for five minutes five to ten minutes a day for um for several you know, for a month or so can make a massive difference to children's uh, ability to decode quickly but and then what they need is lots of experience of of interacting, sitting down, looking at text, the orthographic experience of being asked to read independently. So it is, you know, reading aloud is no, in no way a substitute for that. What it is, it's a, it's a backdoor mechanism for getting the benefits for being able to read that, that lots of these children would otherwise miss out on. I think that sort of strategy would certainly probably help in my sort of head with that paragraph where you have the letters just popping up or the words popping up. But then obviously the students can build their fluency through familiarity with some of those sort of uh, words that are in that sort of text itself. I think uh, there seems to be a, a popularity around the question uh, around pre-aiding of reading. So whether it's pre-teaching that concept and idea of uh, students gaining an understanding about the characters and the themes within the text before they actually approach the text. Where, where's your thoughts on that? So you've, 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 you've chosen that you're going to read a particular passage and you're, you, you pre-teach some of the ideas in there. To, yeah. To so looking at, looking, yeah, looking at Bink's question, so balancing between the, put, taking the class through the text and creating fluency and explaining. So do we think that pre-teaching is helpful to teaching the key ideas, the characters, the vocabulary? I think a small amount of it. I think if you do too much of it, then, uh, then, then you, you're in danger of, of losing children. They're, 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 you're giving them too much to pay attention to. And so if you're, you know, if you're, you're probably better off balancing a little bit of that with you're reading a text and you take, okay, so this is a complex area. Let's stop. Let's unpack this a little bit and then, and then move on as unobtrusively yeah. as possible. One of the areas, um, and you've seen it, I've seen it in the class, and I'm sure you and many others will have as well, is that anxiety about a student being picked on to read, or even just silent reading, and obviously the differences in levels. Is there anything you think we can do as teachers to support those students with those anxieties around reading during the lesson? Yeah, don't pick on them to read. That's a really grim wow. thing to do. You know, I mean, I think children should have experience of reading aloud, but uh, but if, if they're not skilled readers, if they don't have, if they haven't, for no fault of their own, uh, master fluency then 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 picking on them and 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 making them struggle with it in the classroom is just going to humiliate them and and there's absolutely no purpose they're not going to benefit from it in any way uh you you know the, the, there might be some benefit from doing it privately um but but certainly not publicly um yeah. but at the same time you know if you've got if you've got enthusiastic keen readers who who want to read um then then giving them an opportunity to do so that's fine but forcing someone who who, ha who can't do it to do something like that is not something I'd recommend. Mary Myers just I want to sort of announce she's tweeting out saying it's a stonking session so far so I just wanted to kind of give you sort of that accolade as well with that thumbs up for that. Further questions coming in around embedding whole school literacy um, so whole school reading strategies and how it is that obviously we can make that work for everyone um, given that perhaps not everyone has the ability or the, the subtleties that are required to teach that that reading. Is it, have you got any thoughts on that? Just in terms of practicing uh, the developing of the fluency across with reading, so in, in, in an independent scenario or whether it be pastoral teams, for example, in their tutorials uh, in the mornings reading to classes. Okay. So I, I think there's some benefit if you, you know, that, that, that once, once children have, you know, that once you've intervened of those that can't decode and you've got some sort of mechanism for improving their fluency there, th the next step that I think can be useful and, and certainly classroom teachers can can use this is that 
when we're, we're, when we're, we're giving children orthographic experience, we're putting text in front of them and asking them to read independently, one of the things that can be really useful is ask them, teach them explicitly how to skim read. So, so skilled readers, practiced readers, skim read automatically. So as, you know, as a teacher, every time someone sends you a work email, skim, delete, not for me. You know, that we do it really, really rapidly and really automatically, but the children who are not used to reading don't skim um, automatically. They have to be shown how to do it. And, um, and so I would model that. I would say, you know, look, here's me live, allowed skim reading. So I'm not looking at the grammatical words. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna sound out the or at. And I'm particularly looking for, I'm looking for the nouns in a sentence because those nouns are going to be that will have most significance to point out to me what's, what's actually happening. So going back to the question you asked earlier about pre-teaching, the one thing that I would absolutely pre-teach is the head nouns in a, in, in, for each paragraph of text. So if children don't know those, then they're going to very quickly come unstuck. Uh, and then and explicitly teaching scanning. You know, that one of the things which, uh, as practice skilled readers, we don't we don't tend to recognise or, or or know is that if we're if we're if we're looking if we're reading a text to to answer questions for, for comprehension, we we know at a really implicit level that the information that we need will be presented sequentially. So the first answer is going to be at the top, and second answer in the middle, third answer at the end, and uh, and and we and this is, and just knowing this is hugely. Uh, time saving so that you know you find the answer to number two a skilled reader won't go back to the begin beginning of the text and look for number three whereas a student that doesn't have much orthographic experience is as likely to do that as not because they don't know how the text works so explicitly showing them how answers are going to be sequenced and and also other things like teaching them that to look out for things like capital letters and numbers because they're they're little eye magnets that really that really stand out and often have a lot of relevance um, and and to use some you know to skill up teachers with things like generic um, uh, comp strategies like um, I used to really really struggle as a young teacher with uh, trying to teach analysis and uh, you know I'd give children children a passage of text to read and say I'd like to analyze this and they'd say what do you mean and I'd say look just I said, and you know, I didn't really know how to explain what I wanted. I knew what it was, but not. so what I found really, really useful is saying to them, you know, imagine that you've got a camera, and I want you to zoom in on individual words and phrases to sort of pick out their particular meaning, and then zoom back out to take in the context. So you know that, you know, the, the the sort of thing that sometimes children, there's a certain sort of child that will start seeing things that aren't there, they make these bizarre imaginative leaps and you, you have to get them to zoom out again going, really, is that in this, it's not about dragons, is it? You know, and, and by that process of zooming in to be analytical and zooming out to be evaluative, it's quite a, a useful way to teach uh, quite an abstract set of ideas, but it all depends on this, you know, it helps with orthographic experience, but you've got to get fluency sorted first. There's some really sort of interesting concepts. I think the passive things that we do as adult readers that perhaps we don't take for granted, like, like you say, picking up on the capital letters and the numbers and that sort of key areas is a really sort of interesting one for us not to forget when we are uh, working with young, young adults and children. Audio books. Obviously, we mentioned fact finding, yeah. you mentioned obviously YouTube clips and so forth. Yeah. Where, where do you, do you think there's a use for audio books? Uh, I, I love audio books. I listen to audio, you know, whenever I'm, I do a lot of driving or less so at the moment, but normally I do a lot of driving and I always uh, listen to, yeah, it's a great time to catch up on reading. Um, I think though, it's worth being aware of that there are downsides to using audio books in the classroom because, and I don't know if you've ever tried this yourself, but when you're listening to an audio book, it's quite hard just to sit there doing nothing um, the our tender, you know, so they're they're great to listen to when you're doing something else. So if you're running, if you're you know doing a bit of cooking, something like that, where you you don't need to have to you don't have to think much, and, but your hands are occupied. Now, if you if you sit children in a classroom and and you read aloud to them, then you're their focal point. They concentrate on you. They're interacting with you, even though they're not speaking necessarily. And you know you're pausing to ask questions whenever relevant. But, um, but if you play an audio book, they've got no focus. So, you know, you could do something like, um, there's, 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 there's some evidence that doodling can help aid concentration. So you could say, you know, if you need to just sort of doodle. 
there's a fine line between doodling and drawing. Drawing is definitely not an aid to concentration because uh, it diverts, you know, you won't be listening, you'll just be drawing your little picture. So, you know, it's, it's a tough balance. I would recommend wherever possible, read live rather than play a pre-recording, but, yeah. you know, needs must. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I think it kind of ties back into that, giving the students too much to concentrate on, on the classroom. Yeah, it could lose the value of the audio book in that aspect. I think uh, there seems to be a running theme in terms of orthographical progression seems to be stemming from the younger years, so your early years schooling. And one of the questions that's come up is about how can we aid orthographical progress with our students in their later phases of education, so into key stage three and key stage four. You so children need like, lots of experience of looking at text, so you give them some of those generic pieces of instruction, like here's explicitly some, some instructions on how to improve skimming and scanning, here's a explicit instruction on how to how to improve analysis um, and then lots of experience of, of mediating that with them in the classroom. Flora's posed a question and I think I've heard sort of other schools doing this and I mentioned this already around tutors reading along reading a book alongside the tutor group and the tutor group having that same book and following and I know that it's one of the yeah. points you raised in your presentation already. Yeah. Do you think that this would have just as much of an impact if it were just a case that the teacher should read to the pupils alone without them having a copy? Yeah and it's a lot cheaper. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, there's no, I mean, this, one of the things that I've done with a couple of schools that I've worked with is um, help put in place um, a system where we do this sort of thing. So you probably, you know, people will probably have come across um, drop everything and read dear. And the idea, the idea being that a certain portion of the school day, you stop instruction and you pick up a reading book and everyone reads in silence. And, and that works really, really well for children that like reading already or who are or who are skilled readers. But for those who aren't, um, then it just becomes an exercise in the teacher being the reading police and um, busting people for holding their books upside down. And, you know, and there's not really, you know, there's not much value in that for the people that need it most. So instead, if you had a drop everything and listen, deal, a new deal. Yeah. Um, if you had drop everything and listen, then, then that's much more, that's much more democratic. That's much more, um, you know, th th that's much more accessible for everybody. So, um, if you, you can't, you know, so one of the things I've done um, with, as I said, with a couple of schools is to have a whole school system where there's been a decision made that um, the 20 minutes of, of each day is going to be given over to reading aloud and teachers will read from the same passage from the same text to students wherever they are in the school. So um, one of the texts that I did this with was um, Treasure Island. And um, so basically chopped up Treasure Island into 20 minute sections. Uh, so roughly a chapter, a chapter, a, a session. And, uh, um, and, and then every day a teacher would get an email saying, don't forget you're reading from page 17 to page 32 or whatever it is. And, and in order so that the same lessons weren't hit all the time, it would be, you know, so it would be Monday period one, Tuesday period two, and then the following week, Monday period two, Tuesday period three. So it would rotate throughout. And, um, and, and the real advantage of that is that children are all experiencing the same text at the same time. And, um, and so it's a really good community building exercise. And one of my, one of my favorite experiences when um, working with the school on this was to go in and visit and sort of go for a progress meeting uh, it was about midway through. And um, I was getting some lunch in the dinner hall and I just earwigged a, a conversation between a couple, some, a couple of, I don't know, year seven, year eight boys chatting about, they'd obviously had been read to before lunch and they were chatting about what had happened, what Long John Silver had done. And, and whilst they were talking, this older boy, maybe a year 10 or year 11, he just leaned over and went, no, no, and he explained something that he thought they'd misunderstood. And I thought, wow, I'm watching a conversation in a, in, a, in a secondary school in England, in, you know, whenever, uh, about Victorian literature. When does that ever happen? You know, that, that sort of cross, cross um, age group experience, I thought was really powerful. And obviously that's a big investment for a school to choose to do that. And I think that as individual teachers, it's, if you're, you know, you're a form teacher, if you're a form tutor, just pick a book you like, that you think this would have, you know, I, I think kids, the age that I tutor would be, would get something from this, just read a bit to them every day. Um, if you're an English teacher, abs definitely, definitely do that. Just, just pick a book and just read it and don't kill it by overanalyzing it and doing essays on it, just, just reading. Um, one of the questions I noticed uh, a couple of people had asked as I was, 
as I was talking, coming up in the stream, was, was um, a couple of people asking for explanation about that study that I was referencing. Yeah. Um, do you, do you, is it okay if I... Yeah, please do. That was where I was going to go next. <laughs> yeah, so, so one, of, one of the things... So just to give you a bit more detail about that, if you're interested, what they did in that is they, they read two novels back to back and they, they, they call... In the study, they refer to them as challenging novels, but really they're not that challenging. There were things like The Boy in the Striped Pajamas and that sort of thing. Um, and so what would happen is the... The, the, and it wasn't all reading aloud. They were doing a bit of, you know, a bit of independent reading, a bit of, a bit of reading around the class. That wasn't the condition that was being, was being looked at. But um, there were lots of questions and discussion that was going on. So, you know, teachers would stop and sort of ask children for their reactions and responses to things or, or give them some explanation of difficult points. And, but what there wasn't is, right, everybody, let's write a paragraph about that. Let's let's you know let's write a postcard to one of these characters telling them what we think there wasn't any of those kinds of writing exercises that often go alongside the reading of, of books and and you know dare i say often kill off the the enthusiasm and engagement and and that you know, just just judging this on the merits within this particular study the the, the progress that children were able to make would suggest that there's more benefit that comes from just reading and talking about text than there is from having to do, you know, written exercises to try and, I mean, why are we doing those? If those aren't the things that actually help make children make progress, then, you know, it does invite the question, why are we doing them? Quite a few points there. I think going through some of the other questions, there seems to be kind of a theme about encouragement of independent reading and that extracurricular reading. How do we, how do we kind of expand on their experiences? So if in school we were to drop everything yeah. and read, read aloud and students just listen or reading in lessons and so forth all of our subjects now our students have gone through five hours of lessons having so much exposure to orthography from our teachers how can we encourage our students to then take that independently uh, take that yeah. independent? well it's tough i mean it's really really difficult we live we live i mean if, if if anyone sort of wants to go into this in sort of more detail i really recommend a book by uh, marianne wolf called reader come home and she really talks in there about the fact that with you know, with the, the advent of the digital world and, and the type of reading that we're all becoming um, attuned to, to doing in, in that kind of environment, that the, the, the sustained concentration needed for sitting down and just reading is something that's being lost. And her argument in that book is that if we value this, then it's something we need to fight hard as a society to try and uh, maintain. Because it's, but you know, my, my sense is, that it's something we are going to lose. It's you know it's something that is going to become less and less common that people have that sustained concentration. You know I've got two teenage daughters, a um, fourteen year old and a sixteen year old, and you know they both um, they both really liked reading. They, we did a lot. Of, I read to them tons as a as a parent at bedside that sort of thing. They were both able um, independent readers, and now you know now that they're they're just it's a struggle to get them to do it. They don't want to, they can do it. They just don't want to, they'd rather do anything else. So I, if I want them to read aloud, I, or sorry, if I want them to read, I still have to read with them. You know, I'm currently my um, 16 year old who's going to be starting a, a, a levels in, uh, in September. You know, I'm reading Orwell's 1984 to her because I, she's not reading it to herself now, you know, you could sort of get into, you know, whether that's a good thing or not. But, um, but what it sort of, you know, so I would definitely say to parents, read to kids, even when they're older. But, um, you know, we know that that's just going to add to the asymmetry of experience between children from more and less advantaged backgrounds. Um, how do you get children? To, I mean, one of the ways, and this is surprisingly, this is a lot more effective than you might think. Um, if you as a school set reading homework, which is, let's say, read 20 pages a day over the weekend, you'll be amazed at how many kids just do it. You know, loads won't, but loads will, who wouldn't have otherwise. You know, I, when I've done this in, in, a, you know, in schools, parents have got in touch going, oh, my son's told me he's got reading homework to do and he has to read for 20 minutes, so he's just doing it. How did that happen? Because we told him to. You know, mm. that, that sometimes things which you think that would never work, even really, really simple things can have an effect. You, but in, I don't think there's, any, you know, if, the whole reading for pleasure narrative, how do you get kids to read for pleasure? How do you get kids to do anything they don't want to do for pleasure? If you ever find that out, 
you know, you can take over the world. You'll have, you'll have found out the secrets. But, um, you know, there is no way of making, forcing people to do things for pleasure they don't want to do. Um, and, and I think a lot of the narratives that we have in school, you know, how do we trick kids into... And I think, you know, I think one of the, one of the things we ought to consider is if we value reading so much as a profession, as teachers, if we think reading is so important, why are we so unsuccessful at communicating that sense of importance to so many students, particularly boys? You know, why do they, why do they have this, you know, and, and I'm not seeking to blame anyone. I'm just sort of saying that's, you know, something we should look at. And I think a lot of what we might say is that with, there's a huge narrative in schools about the value of reading. This is what, this is why reading is important. These are the things that you can do with it. This is why it's socially, culturally important. And not enough about, actually, it's the content that matters. You know, people, people don't just, and in the abstract, love reading. They love reading something or they don't, you know, they like this, but not that. And, and you know, maybe we need to think more about, about the content. And also maybe reading for pleasure is just a bit of a low bar anyway. Maybe, maybe instead the message in school should be about reading for betterment. You know, if you believe that reading can make us better people, and I think it can, then, then that's something that maybe we should, we should you know, challenge ourselves with. What can we do to, to make children better by exposing them to things that we think are perhaps going to be enriching for them? Yeah, I think, I think there's a, some valid points very much so in terms of, like you say, you know, a big drive on uh, enjoying reading and so forth. And those students that perhaps don't enjoy reading, actually, what about looking at it from what you can get from it then outside of pleasure? <laughs> um, so that, yeah, yeah. it's that betterment and it is that making them more clever as, as studies have shown within your presentation alone. Where do you stand on things like accelerated reader and sort of platforms that are brought in by schools? I know that seems to be sort of a, a common yeah. thing. Um, well, I, you know, I don't want to open a can of worms here. I'm not, yeah. I'm not a particular fan, um, you know, that... I, I, if you look into kind of how accelerated reader sort of works out its reading levels, it's not, it's not, I don't think it's particularly valid or valuable the way they do that. So the reading levels thing, you know, the star reader test, I think is quite a poor test of you know, children's ability. Um, but I think that, you know, what it is, it's, it feels like the reason why schools pay so much money, you know, because it's quite expensive is because it feels like we're doing something, you know, oh, there's a problem. We need to do something. This is something let's pay, then we've done it. And, and, I, and I think that, I think we'd be better using our scarce resources in a way which, you know, first targets the most important group, which is children for, who through no fault of their own, haven't yet mastered decoding. And I think one of the things that we should say to ourselves as, uh, as a community of professionals is that if a child hasn't learned to read, it's not their fault, it's the fault of the system. And we all, it's incumbent upon us systemically to do something about that. If we fail, if children leave secondary school unable to read, that's, that's on us. We could have done something if we, you know, it wouldn't have been easy necessarily, but we could have done something, but we chose not to because it was too hard. And I don't, you know, I really think we should face that as a hard truth, that everybody, given enough time and space, can learn to read. You know, and I think it's odd, it feels odd to me that we don't believe that. That, that there are lots of things, there are lots of complex skills where we, if you take something like driving, we, as a society, we say anyone who wants to learn to drive can learn to drive. Um, maybe we should, maybe you know, there are some people who shouldn't be driving. Anyway, you know, we say that, and then, and then we treat driving as something that can absolutely be mastered with enough lessons and enough, you know, enough practice. And, and I think that's absolutely the same way that we should think about reading. Every child can learn to read if we persist really really sort of key points coming across um and there's loads of questions still flooding in so hopefully obviously we can try and get through some more of these is there any questions that, uh, that you wanted to pick up on david yeah there was one that i got from um via email before we started which i felt because it had been a, so um marielina um i think i hope i'm saying that properly as how might reading allow greater bridge um to reading within a, within a wider culture and 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 i, and I hope you know, if I just want to draw your attention back to that sort of project idea that I said of you know, reading a text like Treasure Island with a wide group, if you get that community sense there, that cultural sense of everybody's engaged in reading the same text at the same time, there can be something quite powerful with that. Um, so hope, hopefully Marielina feels that that was um, answered. Um, there's a couple of others that I noticed as we were going around that I clicked and said, 
uh, I'd answer live. So I feel I probably ought to do that. So Ros Burroughs, uh, and I hope, Ros, I hope you feel that we've answered the question about the difficulty of silent reading with the need to do so in exams. And the answer there, is, as I said, about orthographic experience. So we do, reading aloud shouldn't, it's not either or, it's both um, that we should be doing. Um, we've got, I've got a question here from Roland Freeman. Um, which says, do you have any tips on how to look, hook reluctant boys into reading independently? And, and I go back to, you know, I've just re re recapitulate the same points I've made, I've made already. Why aren't they reading? If they're, why are they reluctant? If it's because it's reading so effortful that they can't do it effortlessly, then you've got to tackle that first. If you don't tackle that, nothing you do will make any difference. Nobody is going to read um, for fun if, if it's not fun. So, so work out why they're not reading and um, if it's that they can read perfectly well they just don't want to that's a really that's a really tough you know how it, it's really tough to compete with the playstation and, and social media and all the other pulls on people's um lives so, which is why i think giving the experience of, of consuming books in a in a community re being read to is such a great way in that you might never convince some children to go and read independently but you can make damn sure they have the experience of reading if you read to them and you know it might not be a perfect solution but it's a lot better than the alternative okay so i think we're going to wrap up there david i want to firstly just say thank you obviously for excellent session brilliant q a obviously we'll stick around for a few minutes and i'll leave the webinar open so that if you have any questions you want to type out you're welcome to do so again the conversation will continue on twitter so using the hashtag ld edu-chat will give uh, those involved a chance to kind of extend that conversation further please 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 do make sure that you are asking those questions following at chilton tsa um on twitter as we put on these events david thank you for your time today thanks very much brilliant thank you guys